Hello and welcome to Skeptics in the Pub Online. I'm James Bremner, your host for this evening. Skeptics in the Pub are a gathering of sceptical minded people from all across the country and now from all across the world. It used to be that we meet in pubs and gather around to hear our speakers talk, but now because of events, we all meet here online. Every two weeks we're having talks at the moment. Uh, your next talk will be available in a couple of weeks and there'll be information down in the chat on the side of this Twitch stream. Um, but it is worth noting that some groups are starting up. They're starting up meeting in public, in, in person, and we're having uh, social events and some talks. So use Ask Jeeves or Alta Vista to find your local group and see if there's something going on near you. Even for some people, this might be the first time you've engaged with skeptics in the pub. So maybe look up for a group near you and see if you fancy joining us in person. Um, in terms of the talk, if the closed captions will make your life easier, they are available on this talk. They're automatic and they're available via a button press in the Twitch window. And there'll be more information in the chat window from our lovely mods. Uh, over in that chat window, we have some fairly basic rules. Just be nice. Uh, we like this to be a nice, safe place for people to talk, talk about the conversation that's going on in the talk, talk about conversations around the talk. Just be nice to each other. If you have specific questions about the talk, we will have a question and answer session at the end after a little break after the talk. Uh, there'll be a Slido link put in the chat to let you put your questions forward for our speaker today. Today's speaker is not only a physicist, as all the cool kids are, but he's also a podcaster, politician and author. He's written many books, including 13 Things That Don't Make Sense and The Quantum Astrologer's Handbook, which is a telegraph book of the year. So please, in the chat, go absolutely wild, give all the emojis, give all the chat waves and all of that sort of thing that I don't understand. For today's speaker, Michael Brooks. Hello. I'm, uh, I'm having to assume now that you're, you're hearing me and seeing me and, uh, and I will just uh, carry on monologuing to myself uh, until I hear otherwise from uh, some kind of, of chat room. Uh, thanks for coming along uh, virtually to this talk. Um, it's, it's called The Art of More. It's about uh, the last book that I've, I've just published, uh, which is about how mathematics created civilization. Um, so I don't know how many of you loved maths at school, uh, how many of you hated the subject, uh, but I just want to assure you that this talk is for everyone. It's not technical. Uh, we're not going to be um, talking about how brilliant it is to be able to do really advanced maths. Um, and uh, if you did hate maths at school, uh, I just want to tell you that I'm not surprised uh, because nobody probably ever told you that maths is just not natural. So. Um, let me just illustrate the kind of thing I want to to, to uh, bring to you uh, with this uh, kind of the, ne the next few minutes. I just want to talk to you about three mathematicians uh, and what they did and who they were, just as a kind of introduction to, to what I think maths is really all about. So the first mathematician I want to talk to you about is a, a guy called uh, King Shulgi of Ur. Um, he reigned in what is now uh, southwestern Iraq, uh, and around uh, 2074 BC, he instituted a lot of reforms in his kingdom based on mathematics. He was trained in mathematics, we have records of this, and he actually made his subjects worship him for his mathematical skills. Uh, so we have records of hymns uh, that were, were sung in praise of King Shulgi's mathematical talents. Um, and do you know how good he was at maths? He could count. He could add up and he could subtract. And that's it. Uh, there's actually no mention at all in the records of him being able to multiply or divide anything. Uh, and believe me, you know, the records show that he had a great promotional crew. There was lots of propaganda. And if he had been able to do that, we would know about it. Uh, so but these skills were enough for Shulgi uh, to recognize the importance of mathematics. 
uh, and the potential of, of numbers. Uh, and in 2074 BC, he instituted these reforms, a political system effectively that put maths at the center of his kingdom. Uh, he imposed the sexagesimal, uh, that's base 60 number system so that everyone was aligned and everyone had to follow this. And uh, he also uh, arranged compulsory account keeping with audits uh, for all the civil servants and traders. And this third kingdom uh, of Ur, uh, Shulgi's kingdom, has been called the world's first mathematical state. And it enabled uh, the kingdom to basically amass enough wealth, because they were in control of the numbers, to become the world's largest city at the time. Uh, and for Shulgi to uh, finish uh, this uh, building, which is the great ziggurat uh, that his father had begun, and he also established a, a network of, of trading uh, partners and, and roads as well. So um, this was an enormous uh, success, just based really on the sort of implementation of mathematics. Now, the second mathematician I want to talk to you about is uh, this guy, John Napier, making multiplication easy since 1614. Uh, so Napier was a Scottish laird who decided in the late 1500s uh, that astronomers were basically too prone to making mistakes. And uh, he spent the next 20 years doing something about that. So their calculations were incredibly complex and incredibly difficult when they were trying to sort of map the heavens and, and make predictions about where things were going to be. And uh, what he did was use the properties of right angle triangles. And you'll probably learn during this talk that I'm a huge fan of right angle triangles these days. Um, he used their properties to produce a, a table of logarithms, uh, as he called them. This uh, had 10 million entries. It took him 20 years to produce. But what it did was basically turn all of uh, the astronomers' multiplications into just simple additions so that they were less prone to making mistakes. Um, Pierre Simon Laplace uh, actually said about this that it doubled the life of the astronomer. Uh, and Johannes Kepler was so excited about how easy logarithms had made mathematics that he was actually told off by one of his peers. And uh, the, the quote is, uh, he, uh, he, he was told, it's not seemly for a professor of mathematics to be childishly pleased about any shortening of the calculations. So that was him told. Um, but Napier's work um, in itself was, was useful for astronomers and navigators at the time, but it was soon developed by William Ortred into the slide rule, or the, the predecessor to the slide rule. And the slide rule has actually powered uh, the Industrial Revolution. Um, uh, James Watt, who built this steam engine that you can see there on the top, uh, actually made his own uh, design of slide rule based on Napier's logarithms. And uh, then Enrico Fermi, uh, during the Second World War, uh, the Nobel Prize winning uh, physicist, actually used his slide rule all the time as he was developing the atomic bomb and leading the atomic bomb project, the Manhattan Project. Uh, and then uh, the slide rule was also uh, used for the entire Apollo project uh, to land humans on the moon. And what you see below Napier there is Buzz Aldrin's slide rule, uh, which went for auction at $77,000 in uh, I think it was the sort of early two 2010s um, and uh, he would have bought it or NASA would have bought it for about uh, $10 or $11 so a uh, massively inflated but actually Buzz Aldrin used this slide rule uh, to to make the calculations on the fly as he landed uh, the craft onto the moon so so slide rules based on Napier's logarithms were a huge huge invention um, and and you know, incredibly important until the invention of the uh, electronic calculator in the early 1970s, and nobody needs one anymore. But still an incredible innovation. So uh, my third mathematician I just want to present to you now is uh, this woman, Florence Nightingale. Uh, she'll be familiar to you. I remember having a, a Florence Nightingale Ladybird book uh, when I was a child, you know, which told me all about the lady with the lamp. Um, the interesting thing about the lady with the lamp is uh, that th this whole thing came from a report in the Times uh, on 8th of February 1855, and it described her as a ministering angel. And as her slender form glides quietly along each corridor, every poor fellow's face softens with gratitude at the sight of her. When all the medical officers have retired for the night and silence and darkness have settled down upon these miles of prostrate sick, she may be observed alone with a little lamp in her hand, making her solitary rounds. And this was the, the kind of you know, the setup that turned her into the lady with the lamp in the Crimean War uh, at the hospital in uh, Scutari. But actually, um, 
I mean, interestingly, the the reason that she was the the only woman around there with her little lamp was that she had locked away all of the other nurses. So they were uh, basically, uh, she felt prone to being uh, picked up by some of the other army officers. And she came across one nurse who had, for instance, got pregnant uh, when late night assignations going on. So what Florence Nightingale did was round up all the nurses at the end of the day and uh, and put them to bed and uh, lock them in their dormitory and kept the key on her. And she actually went back into the dormitory after those rounds uh, when she was the lady with the lamp and uh, slept with the key under her pillow uh, to preserve uh, moral uh, dignity in the hospital. But she was an excellent mathematician. She she's known for this um, you know this kind of incredible sort of work in medicine. But actually, uh, her work in mathematics I think is is even more impressive. And uh, she'd studied mathematics from an early age. Uh, she did her training in France and Germany, for instance, and she got used to collecting hospital data, uh, hospital reports, statistics, information on how hospital sanitization and nursing systems were organized. And while she was in Scutari, Scutari, that's when she undertook this vast sort of piece of work, uh, recording the numbers of patients dying there and elsewhere, and analyze the figures to show that uh, the, 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 basically the battlefront hospitals had only a 12.5% mortality rate and the hospital had a 30 7.5% uh, mortality rate. And so in order to get this across and to get somebody to do something about it, she invented the, this wedge diagram you can see on the bottom right. And it basically showed at a glance that disease was killing more soldiers than battle wounds. And uh, so the area of each sector uh, represents a single month's deaths, and she distinguished them by colour. Now, she presented this diagram to the Secretary of State for War and then included it in a book uh, that she wrote. She sent a copy to Queen Victoria, who then asked her to come and explain it to her. Um, and as a result, she procured a royal commission into the health of the army and basically uh, instigated massive reforms in military medical practices. And she said that the diagram here, this innovation in mathematics and statistics uh, was central to this. So she, you know, she says here, you can see in this quote, diagrams are of great utility for illustrating certain questions of vital statistics by conveying ideas on the subject through the eye, which cannot be so readily grasped when constrained in figures. Uh, Florence Nightingale was elected as the first female member of the Royal Statistical Society. Uh, and, uh, and this was not a celebrity appointment. She was genuinely recognized as being a great statistician. Now, what's my point? My point really is, and, and Florence Nightingale sees it here, that actually numbers are pretty difficult and you have to convey them in, in clever ways. And the, there's a really important thing to, to realize from this is that not only are numbers difficult, but numbers are not natural to us. Um, and yet, if we can master them, we can do amazing things with them. Uh, and basically, I want to sort of make the point tonight that maths is not some abstract number work uh, done for its own sake. You know, we're not generating numbers, generating mathematics even. We, we develop mathematics uh, because it's useful um, and useful enough to change the world around us and useful enough to, to build the world around us. Um, if you've ever seen the Hagia Sophia, uh, in in uh, Istanbul, that was built by two mathematicians. You know, mathematicians really, you know, do make the world a different place. Um, so I'm I'm really going to sort of develop the point that that maths is like politics and economics and law. It's the sort of foundation of society and of civilization. And uh, I would even sort of go so far as to say it's really maybe we should be including it as one of the humanities. Um, but let's sort of move on. Uh, let me just tell you, um, this is what I, I, I think we don't understand, really, when we deal with maths. It, maths. Maths is not what you think. It's not just a set of technical rules. It's actually, I think, the very thing that separates us from the rest of the animal species. Uh, our ability to do maths makes humans really quite unique and a really powerful force on the planet for good and bad. Um, and we came to do maths because we overcame a limitation that all untrained animal species have, which is we don't naturally count beyond three. So if you're looking at this picture of fruit, uh, what you might see is that you can look at uh, you know, the, the plums and you can see immediately how many there are and the pears too. And the other things, um, and it's hard for me to tell, you're not here with me, I can't tell what you're doing and I, I don't know what your answer is. But uh, it seems to me, certainly when I do this, I have to count things that are, uh, when there's more than three of them. 
And if I count the four apples, then I'm counting them really as two groups of two. And um, any you know, investigations of animal uh, abilities have actually shown that um, animals can sort of distinguish three from two and, and two from one. But higher than that, what they distinguish is a bigger pile against a smaller pile. You know, they see more. And, and so they see more or less as they, and this is, you know, you get this sort of counting system, which is basically one, two, three, more. Uh, it's a pile of stuff. And uh, we know this partly as well because actually it's it's a it's a human trait that we've seen in certain tribes. So uh, the picture you're seeing is a man from the Piraha tribe in the Amazon. And the Piraha don't bother counting beyond three. Uh, they they literally just just don't really do it. Uh, when a guy called Daniel Everett went to sort of study them, uh, he and a colleague sort of did some number work with them. And, and uh, what you see there is a, is a is an attempt to get them to match quantities. So they set up a, a, a sort of quantity of batteries, like seven, eight, or nine batteries, and said, you know, can you put as many of these sort of red pieces of cloth down as there are batteries. And uh, they just couldn't do it if there was more than three batteries. And uh, partly they just didn't see the point of it. But they, you know, even when they were trained and, and sort of, you know, focused on the task, it just wasn't in their, uh, well, quite literally in their vocabulary. They don't have numbers for the, for anything beyond three. And we're in a position where actually uh, we're, you know, we're reliant on learning new words in order to count. But that's what we as humans in most societies on Earth have done. Uh, and of course, going beyond three is where the good stuff is. Um, and, and that's where mathematics is effectively. So maths is the art of dealing with larger quantities uh, than our brains can naturally deal with. And that's extremely powerful. Uh, so, you know, we, we've got maths and we've sort of learned to put words onto bigger numbers. Uh, where does that get to us? Well, that obviously gets us to the point where you get um, the abilities of King Shulgi. Uh, as I said, in this is sort of, you know, 4,000 years ago, and the, the sort of cutting edge is, is just the ability to count, to add, to subtract, and others in his kingdom, the scribes, could, could multiply and divide as well. And that's not to be sniffed at, because actually just being able to count uh, makes an enormous difference. So, um, when I looked into this, when I was writing my book, uh, The Art of More, by the way, is because it's, you know, it's all about getting to that more, uh, more than three. Um, and the thing I found most interesting, really, uh, in this sort of area is the fact that, you know, once you can count, you can make accounts. You can, you can um, effectively just keep records of things. And that, of course, gave us trade. Uh, and it also gave us accounting. And accounting uh, was, you know, to me, incredibly interesting to kind of look into the history of accounting. And I had no idea um, how desperate historians of accounting were to talk to me about it. I don't think they get a lot of attention. Um, but the benefits of trade, of being able to count and then trade, are obvious because uh, it allows specialism, which is a kind of hallmark of civilization, uh, the exchange of skills. So I don't have to go out and plow a field uh, if I can do the metal work uh, to make you a plow and sell it to you, and then I can buy some of your crops. Um, but of course, if you haven't yet, then uh, you haven't got anything to buy my plow with. So we need a promise system. And that promise system is effectively money. Uh, and money, of course, requires arithmetic. And it also requires record keeping. And in your record keeping started to come about as people were settling and then trading with each other. So, um, people started to make accounts, as King Shulgi did. Uh, interestingly, after the Babylonian sort of civilization, accounting seemed to sort of disappear in, in these civilizations, and, and people sort of didn't do so much of it. Uh, we think that it was still going on in India, and it was still going on in China, certainly. Um, but it was sort of didn't make it to the West as a concept until the sort of uh, 15th century. And a guy called Luca Pacioli uh, brought it back from travels in North Africa, in fact. And this allowed double entry bookkeeping to, to start to, to be used. And double entry bookkeeping gives you the ability to basically sort of see a business as an entity by itself, uh, distinct from a person. And you can see the value of that business. And you can start to treat that business effectively like capital. So you can sell that business if you want to for money. And this is basically what brought us everything that leads to modern corporations. And I just wanted to point out this thing that you can see down on the bottom left here is um, is a Chinese number system uh, where they use negative numbers uh, to represent debts. 
and, uh, and and they would have them in black and the, the positive numbers were written in red. And uh, they used negative numbers thousands of years before uh, they were accepted in the West uh, because they were useful for accounting. They were useful for creating records of debt. So um, basically, it's really, um, it seems really simple. And I'm sure very few of you are that interested in the history of accounting per se. But when you start to think about how that allow people to sort of be free from their businesses and pass them on uh, and, and move into sort of different areas of, of, of work, it actually made an enormous impact on, on how we run societies. Another thing that accounting did uh, was bring us an incredible uh, revolution. So uh, the guy you see on the net left here is Jacques Necker. Jacques Necker was the, um, the finance minister for France uh, before the revolution. He was a chief accountant and he'd been trying to fix France's broken accounting system and basically reduce its crippling national debt. It was not popular with the ruling classes because he exposed with his record keeping uh, their exuberant sort of uh, profligate. Uh, it's sort of indulgence, uh, especially in the royal court. And uh, he lost his job because of that. Uh, but interestingly, um, although you know, the ruling classes were losing money hand over fist, uh, others recognised that this was an important thing to do. Uh, so he lost his job, but he gained a loyal band of followers. And when they stormed the Bastille, they carried a bust of Necker on their shoulders. Uh, so uh, you know, this is you know, a, a sort of real revolutionary accountant. And the other one you can see there, much better picture, weirdly enough, is Alexander Hamilton. Um, it's not really, it's Lin-Manuel Miranda, but you know. Um, and Hamilton, of course, uh, was inst instigate uh, was sort of you know, central to uh, the American uh, Revolution, uh, the independence for the United States, and was a huge fan of the English and Dutch, particularly accounting systems. And uh, he uh, built the financial foundations of America on the same principles of accounting uh, that had you know come from our mastery of numbers. So you might you know go and see Hamilton the musical and, and enjoy the music. Uh, accountants go and in, and enjoy the fact that it's all actually about you know financial prudence so this is the basics really and just numbers and how they add and subtract and and how they create an enormous amount of potential for sort of uh, operating a society but let's let's move on um a mastery of arithmetic gets you a long way uh, and i think um that's probably at this point, you know, we're kind of at the end of a primary school mathematics education in some ways. Uh, but I want to run you through some other things that aren't part of uh, primary education. So um, let's move on to geometry, for instance. Now, I remember doing geometry. I was never very interested in it at all. Um, but uh, one of the most famous things that, that everybody knows is Pythagoras' theorem, uh, where the sum of the square of the two shorter sides is equal to the square of the hypotenuse, the longer the diagonal side here. It wasn't Pythagoras' invention at all. Um, around the time of King Shulgi and when they were building the pyramids in Egypt, this was how uh, construction workers would create a right angle. So you just knot a rope in the right ratio of lengths. So you have three units and then four units and then five units. And you put those together to make a triangle and you know you've got a right angle. And uh, people were using Pythagoras' theorem, you know, really thousands of years before Pythagoras was around. Uh, we've just um, venerated the, the Greek sort of contribution to maths far, far too much. Uh, something I won't really get into now unless we get into, into it in the, in the Q&A perhaps. So, uh, we have this sort of uh, geometry, the kind of the mathematics of shapes and measuring stuff. And uh, we uh, obviously, you know, you'll know, you know, you can do uh, interesting things with circles once you know numbers uh, and you have these shapes and you can work out that there's a constant factor between the circumference and the diameter of a circle, for instance. You know, this factor pi uh, that, that's so sort of central to so much of, of civilizational sort of mathematics. Um, but it's also interesting uh, for other things. So you can use geometry uh, massively for, for navigation. Uh, so um, this is uh, the kind of the root of, of uh, all sort of medieval navigation. It's basically a right angle triangle. Uh, this is a quote from Guillaume Denis. Uh, navigation is nothing more than a right triangle. And he wrote this uh, in 1683. He had set up a royal sailing school in Dieppe where he taught sailors who, who realized they needed to know geometry. He taught them you know, Euclid. He taught them the, the basics of geometry and particularly of right angle triangles uh, in order to be able to navigate their way through, uh, through the, the seas and around the Mediterranean. 
by the way, I'm, I did put the, the book uh, Sailing School in the bottom left-hand corner there. And earlier, I forgot to mention Daniel Everett's, uh, sorry, Caleb Everett's book on numbers. But I thought these are great sources if you want to find out more on any of these particular topics. Um, so, so Guillaume Denis is teaching, even pirates are coming to his school to kind of learn better navigation skills. And, uh, and you see a sextant there at the top, but that's, uh, that's actually a really complex and sophisticated instrument compared to how uh, medieval sailors were, were getting around, uh, particularly in the, in the Mediterranean. Uh, so uh, they had tools like this uh, thing you see at the bottom right, is, uh, it's called a sinecal quadrant, actually invented by uh, Islamic sailors. Um, who would basically use it to find signs and cosines of angles as they plotted things uh, and worked out courses that they needed to take. And they would need the signs and cosine because they would know the angle and they would know the distance they wanted to travel. And they had to make um, calculations based on signs and cosines. And so this was a way for them to get uh, the signs and cosines. And because I can't highlight it, I can't really show you how it works, but uh, you just have to buy the book and work it out. So in the book, I actually work out um, how to do a particular journey. Uh, this is the journey from uh, Athens to Heraklion, for instance. And uh, what we've got is a set of tools that these uh, sailors had that were based on, on uh, geometry, based on right angle triangles. Uh, but they didn't have to know about sines and cosines because it was sort of programmed into the, the tools that they were given. So, for instance, if they wanted to sail from Athens to Heraklion and the wind was in the wrong direction, so they had to sail due south for a while. And then uh, what I've got there is east, southeast and then going back to south, southeast. Uh, they needed to calculate the distances and the angles involved. And they would basically do this uh, with the thing at the top, which is a Toleta de Marteloyo. Uh, which is uh, actually based on sines and cosines, but none of the sailors had to, to know any of that. They just knew for every 100 miles you've sailed off course and by how many rums, uh, which they get from the Windrose chart below it, uh, so how many of those sort of divisions off course they were, uh, they basically can do a multiplication that, uh, that gives them the amount that they should sail in this new direction. And it's a really interesting sort of process to go through. And I, when I was writing the book, I went through quite a, a few times sort of trying to work out how easy it was to use these things. And once you're used to it, it's incredibly easy. And you don't need to know about sines and cosines. You just plug the numbers in, do a couple of multiplications, and you're away. It's incredibly actually sophisticated sort of tool uh, for, for sailing. Uh, so, so yes, yeah, so, so you've got geometry being used by sailors. And of course, um, Christopher Columbus was a great user of this. And uh, even his ships, uh, the caravel uh, that he sailed in, would have been built using geometric um, ratios. And there was a geometric algorithm for actually building the caravel. Uh, and then geometry was also used uh, in the sort of time of the Crusades. Uh, so this is Roger Bacon, uh, who wrote a book called Major Work, or that's what he called it himself, which I think is quite a flex. Um, and he uh, has this section in his book called On the Value of Optical Marvels in Converting the Infidel. Uh, he says, I count nothing more fitting for a man diligent in the study of God's wisdom than the exhibition of geometrical forms. And what Roger Bacon was encouraging was for Christians to kind of, you know, wake each other up to fight the, the uh, Islamic threat uh, around Jerusalem by basically learning geometry and producing great works of art that would inspire people uh, to, to sort of join the Crusades. And I think the ironic thing is that all of this um, opt uh, this geometric work really actually came from uh, and Islamic mathematicians. Uh, so this is Ibn al-Haytham, uh, and he wrote a, a, a great book on optics in which he sort of basically worked out that, you know, the light was traveling in straight lines uh, from various points to, to other points. Uh, into the eye, for instance, and you could work out, you know, what you would see based on uh, these straight lines. And, and, and Al Haytham basically worked it all out. He worked out what would happen if there wasn't an eye, but there was a sheet in the way. And that's where you get a camera obscura. I hope you couldn't see that there. Uh, so Al Haytham basically laid the, the, the foundations using geometry, using angles, using his understanding of trigonometry uh, in order to sort of to really give us insights that were useful uh, and, and became very useful uh, for art. So this was how we developed uh, the idea of perspective. And of course, today, you know, we think of perspective as something that we almost learn at primary school or, or maybe even earlier than that. You know, we have this almost natural understanding that, you know, lines converge uh, at a point on the horizon and things like that. But in the in the 15th and 16th centuries, this was something that was really um, not appreciated and understood. And you had to go away and learn it. So um, there's a guy, uh, a, a engraver uh, artist called Albert Dürer, 
uh, you might know. Um, and he sort of planned a trip to Bologna from Germany. And he went to Bologna specifically to learn the mathematics of perspective. Uh, he said, I will learn the secrets of the art of perspective, which a man there is willing to teach me. So it was a big deal for him, and he probably paid quite a lot uh, for it. But you can see, hopefully, uh, this is a, a woodcut that Dürer made um, sort of 20 years later. And uh, he's obviously so fascinated by the process that in this woodcut, he's showing how you get perspective uh, in your drawings. And, and I don't know if you can make it out, and it might be worth you going away and Googling this afterwards. And you can have a close look at this, this woodcut. And what he's showing is that, that people used to make their drawings and make their uh, paintings basically by you know, running strings through a frame so they could work out at what point something like a lute, which is you know a complicated thing to draw with perspective because there's a lot of foreshortening on the curved surfaces and things, um, they would work out exactly what point should be where on the canvas. And, uh, and this became a, a, a well-known technique for producing realistic art. And if you look at the history of art, you see, uh, you know, with the introduction of geometry and perspective, you see this massive shift in the sort of reality of what's being, um, being portrayed. Also incredibly useful uh, for technical drawing. So actually, um, perspective uh, was a revolutionary technology in terms of uh, allowing inventors to create realistic looking representations of their inventions. And you could almost see at a glance whether something would work or not. Uh, what you have here is uh, Leonardo da Vinci's uh, sketches of some engines of war. And you can see how you know, having the perspective makes you able to see exactly what's going on in, in a way that without a perspective drawing, you really wouldn't be able to do. And this allowed craftsmen to make accurately gauged uh, devices, prototypes, parts for, the, uh, for a device. And you basically didn't, have to sort of start making things until you were really convinced that it could work. Um, da Vinci, by the way, in case I forget to say it later, hated fractions. He couldn't understand fractions and, and he, he sort of tried to learn a lot of uh, mathematics. We think of him as this great genius, but actually he just couldn't get his head around fractions at all. And I take great comfort in that. And uh, so let's move on now to algebra. Uh, and I'm, this is a kind of whistle-stop uh, tour of the uh, of the, the sort of subjects you might have done at school. Uh, you probably remember this formula from school: x equals minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four ac all over two a. Many of you can probably just chant this uh, without even really thinking much about it. This is the quadratic formula. It was developed. Uh, by uh, the Babylonians as a tax calculating tool. Uh, and uh, in the 16th century, it became a financial tool in that it enabled uh, quadratic equations generally and quartic uh, um, and cubic equations, allowed you to be able to, if you could manipulate them, if you could solve them, they allowed you to really uh, be able to make projections of loan revenue. Uh, you, you, could, uh, you could basically see how much money you were going to make from lending money at a certain interest rate or whatever. And so financiers would give if you were a job, if you could solve these kinds of things. It was also um, a very important military tool. So uh, this is uh, Niccolo Tartaglia on the top, who did the first sort of algebraic working out of how you should elevate a cannon barrel uh, to achieve a particular range. Uh, interestingly, Tartaglia hated this discovery and was really scared that his mathematics was suddenly going to be able to kill more people. So he actually burned all his notes. Uh, and then uh, he realized that actually his boss, uh, the Duke of Urbino, uh, was involved with the Crusades and, and uh, would really relish this information, uh, especially and if it, it was used to kill Muslims, apparently that was OK. So, um, so time his notes and pass them on. And this became a military science. Algebra became a military science. Uh, but also it's been used for peace. And uh, this is something we perhaps don't appreciate very much. But uh, the guy at the bottom of the screen there is John Nash who you'll remember from the film A Beautiful Mind. John Nash uh, created uh, a thing called the Nash Equilibrium in Game Theory, and that was used, uh, one of the tools that was used, basically to maintain the balance of, of nuclear arsenals throughout the Cold War. And it was through algebra, linear algebra, actually, that um, allowed uh, mathematicians really to... to tell the politicians, this is what we need, this is what you need, this is what's going to happen. And you establish this uneasy detente, but it is a detente and it is peace, uh, because you can find the mathematics in algebra that tells you, okay, you know, this isn't optimum for us, but it's also not optimum for them, but it's the optimum that we can both reach. And you sort of get to the point where you're like, okay, this will do. And uh, a time uh, when uh, 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 treaties had been signed to, to sort of for non-proliferation in 1970, uh, 
the politicians on both sides of the Iron Curtain were actually aware enough of the importance of mathematicians to this, that they allowed uh, mathematicians from each side to meet in Vilnius in 1971 to kind of compare notes on how to you know, achieve this kind of fragile peace. Uh, and, and so in many ways, you could argue that we actually wouldn't be here today uh, without the influence of algebra on world politics, which is, I think, an extraordinary thought because algebra just seems to be something you do as an abstract subject at school. Uh, the woman on the right here uh, is is uh, Anne Moss, and she uh, actually is um, Anna Moss, I should say. Sorry, she's the principal data scientist at Ocado. And I wanted to just mention her. I just wrote about her and some of her colleagues recently about the supply chain issues, and uh, uh, she's a mathematician who used to work at Intel. Um, she publishes, you know, mathematical research. She, she's, uh, you know, extremely. Uh, good mathematician uh, who is using the, the knowledge of algebra and other subjects that she has and her team have in order to basically bring you know, your online shopping to your house. Uh, and this, you know, all over the, the world, there are companies that are using mathematicians and their abilities with algebra to basically solve supply chain problems. Um, and uh, most of them actually wouldn't talk to me for the article that I was writing because they didn't want their mathematicians to divulge trade secrets that clearly was so important that they uh, they, they thought that they might get, give away an edge on their competitors, which I thought was quite funny. Um, but when our civilization collapses, it might well be because we couldn't solve the algebraic problems that we have created for ourselves. So that's algebra. Uh, we're going to move uh, swiftly on to calculus. Uh, which we just use for everything. It's an incredibly important and uh, and vital subject. But um, calculus is the kind of the, the model of change, where algebra was all about finding the hidden thing. Uh, it used to be called the, the hidden thing, the chossa, the, and it was called the art of the thing, was the, the ancient name for algebra. Uh, calculus is about finding um, how one thing changing affects another thing changing. And, and you sort of you know have these tools which I've laid out here so you, you'll have a curve in the center you know the y of x if you if you're mathematically inclined at all and then you can do a derivative which gives you the slope of the curve or you can do an integral which gives you the area under the curve between certain points and actually these are incredibly powerful tools for doing all kinds of things so um we basically found cure or, or, or found the triple therapy for HIV uh, using calculus uh, to work out how dosing uh, at ver various drugs uh, would affect the concentration of the virus in the body uh, using then that was done using calculus. Uh, we have uh, the um, the Spitfire, the iconic Spitfire actually is a result of calculus. So um, it's, it's sort of uh, an incredible sort of thing to, to think but um, the, the guy who designed the Spitfire is a guy called Beverly Shenstone, and he knew some calculus, but he kind of knew that he didn't know enough to get the maximum maneuverability out of an aircraft wing, and he knew it had to be elliptical. And uh, he bumped into a, a professor of calculus from Southampton uh, called Raymond Howland, and uh, he, he, they met by chance, but they got talking to each other. And Howland was really interested in aerodynamics. And uh, Shenstone was really interested in calculus. And they worked together to work out what the optimum sort of configuration of this elliptical wing would be. And they published papers together. And, uh, and Shenstone learned a lot of algebra. And you can read more about it in uh, the book that's down at the bottom there, Secrets of the Spitfire by Lance Cole, which is an excellent source on this. And Lance Cole went through Beverly Shenstone's notes and found his calculus scribblings and, and and, uh, and, and the ways in which he was trying out how to build this amazing. And what we have in the end of it is this uh, aircraft that, that German pilots say you know, won the Battle of Britain. They, they wanted one for themselves. Uh, and, uh, and winning the Battle of Britain was actually a pivotal thing because uh, it was what persuaded America to join the Second World War, changing the course of history, literally with calculus, really, when you trace it back. Um, and, and I know it's a big claim and it's kind of a bit of, you know, for want of a, a, a shoe, a, a, for want of a nail, a shoe was lost, for want of a shoe, a horse was lost and that kind of thing. But you can trace these things back and find that actually these mathematical um, manipulations are so important uh, that actually they can have this incredible uh, effect on history, as we saw with the French Revolution, for instance. Also there, uh, I put in the Lehman Brothers sign. I mean getting calculus involved in, in the financial world, uh, which started in the early 70s uh, with the Black Scholes-Merton Mer um, uh, equation, 
uh, which uh, enabled the, the use of options, basically, in the financial markets. And, and this has never been done before. But they showed that there was a way for everyone to win and make money on, on these things. And, uh, and, and we are sort of living in the legacy of that sort of spiraling and spiraling where calculus and differential equations are used in a kind of black box algorithms to control financial markets uh, operated by people who don't really know what those um, equations are doing, uh, but in many cases just sort of follow the money until it all comes Lapses because there's no value associated with some of the output from these algorithms. So, you know, calculus is there. It's involved in so many things around the, you know, our sort of society, our civilizations, but actually um, for good and bad, I would say, uh, which is, of course, always true of any technological tool. Let me move on to um, imaginary numbers, which is my favorite thing. And uh, I will be tempted to spend too much time on this, but I see that the time is, is running on already. Um, so imaginary numbers are not imaginary, right? They're, I mean, normal numbers are imaginary, if you want to put it like that. There is no such thing as a two. I can't see a two anywhere. I will see two of something. It's a descriptor. And imaginary numbers are just another sort of type of number, if you like. And uh, and I don't know if you could see on this on this diagram, but but I can move from one to minus one along a number line just by subtraction. And I can move the other way by addition, and that's fine. But if I do move by multiplication by minus one, I can go round this way, and I get to a thing here where I've got um, you know all the way round. And if I multiply by minus one, I start with one, I get to minus one a different way. But halfway up there, I've got something that I'm going to call the imaginary number line. If the horizontal one is the number line, the vertical one is the imaginary number line. Now, the imaginary number is the square root of minus one, which shouldn't exist. Because if I square a positive number, I get a positive number. If I square a negative number, I get a, neg uh, I get a positive number. So I can't do the inverse process by starting with a negative number. But actually, it turns out that I can uh, if I just allow these things called, you know, that we now call imaginary numbers. And uh, they were first discovered or first seen properly by uh, this man, Jerome Cardano. Um, and the book in the left hand corner there is, uh, is the Quantum Astrologer's Handbook referred to earlier, Daily Telegraph Book of the Year by me, because I'm kind of obsessed by Jerome Cardano, but that's for another time. Um, and Cardano saw these while he was solving quadratic equations. He saw there were square roots of negative numbers and they seemed to be a real thing. He didn't know how to deal with them, but he acknowledged that they were there and somebody should deal with them. Uh, and we have dealt with them now. And uh, we've moved on and we've used imaginary numbers. And, and any engineers who are watching and listening will, will know that imaginary numbers are kind of central to how the world works, the you know, technological world. So here, imaginary numbers you can relate them to the properties of circles and triangles, sines and cosines. And this actually enabled this man, uh, Charles Proteus Steinmetz, to find a way to simplify uh, the use of electric current uh, and electric technology at a time before America was uh, properly electrified. So we had generators, we had electric appliances, but we had no way to really properly con connect them. And what Steinmetz did was show how electrical engineers could do the calculations that were necessary for this really easily if they only adopted imaginary numbers. Uh, and the calculations that they've been doing before were involved, you know, huge behemoths with sines and cosines and incredibly complex things that you can just convert to uh, using imaginary numbers and they become really simple. A bit like how logarithms uh, convert uh, complicated multiplications to simple additions. So uh, we use this uh, to electrify the world. Uh, as you see, you know, the world is, is a light when you sort of look at it from space. Uh, but this top picture here is the Hewlett Packard garage, the HP garage. Uh, in Silicon Valley, and the, the plaque that's outside of there says this is a place of Silicon Valley. It was built on David Packard's uh, master's thesis that he was doing at Stanford University, and that is full of imaginary numbers. And so their first sort of their first product was a, an amplifier, an oscillator, that was uh, the result of a Packard's thesis. And basically. It, the way he worked out how to do it was using these imaginary numbers to do the calculations. And then he built, you know, he and, and uh, Bill Hewlett built the Hewlett Packard empire and Silicon Valley spawned from all of this. Um, for instance, uh, Steve Jobs went to work for them uh, at, at, uh, at HP. That was his kind of first summer job and uh, inspired him to go off and, and you know, be Steve Jobs. Um, 
So imaginary numbers are incredibly important, incredibly sort of central to the 20th century. Uh, they're also really interesting, I think, from this perspective. I'll just very quickly sort of run you through the idea of, I put an extra number line in, that vertical line for imaginary numbers. And this guy, William Rowan Hamilton, actually put in two more number lines uh, into the, the, the complex, if you like. Uh, so where I had I, uh, he had J and K as well. And he worked out the mathematics of how all this works and how you would have you know, these things multiplying together to give you minus one. And I squared is minus one and J squared is minus one. And K squared is minus one. And he worked out how you would do mathematics with them, uh, which you can see by this uh, this rotary uh, diagram here. So you multiply I by J and that gives you a positive K. And if you go the other way, then it's negative. And, it, and, and the interesting thing about this mathematics is that J times K is not the same as K times J. Whereas if I do four times three, it's the same as three times four in our normal mathematics. So Hamilton was introducing a new kind of mathematics, really. And, um, and you know, something that had never really been seen since, you know, really since the Greeks. I mean, we, we'd not really invented much. And at this point, um, it, there was a, a mathematician at Oxford University called Charles Dog Dodgson, who was at Christchurch College. And he was appalled when the dean of the college put uh, these new things that are known as quaternions onto the uh, syllabus for students to look at and learn. And he said, you know, these are not in Euclid. We shouldn't be teaching anything that's not in Euclid. Uh, this kind of new mathematics is just an absurdity. And uh, he and he got nowhere. The dean wasn't interested in, in his arguments. Uh, nobody, none of his colleagues were interested. They were all sort of, you know, not so conservative and wanted to move forward. So what he did was he wrote a kind of a satirical reductio ad absurdum into the book that he was writing, which was called Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. So Charles Dodgson, aka Lewis Carroll, uh, wrote the Mad Hatter's Tea Party, uh, kind of as a satire on, on this ridiculous mathematics as he saw it. And uh, what you find when you read it, I've just got one quote in here, um, you should say what you mean, the March Hare went on. I do, uh, Alice hastily reported, at least I mean what I say. And they make the point that I mean what I say is not the same as I say what I mean. And you've got all these sort of twisting around that, that you know, are just like JK is not equal to KJ. And uh, and various things in there. So Hamilton had had said that you know, maybe one of these numbers is actually what time is if we want to represent it in physics, and uh, that's why the reason why uh, the Mad Hatter's uh, the Hatter's Tea Party uh, time has stopped and it's always six o'clock and uh, and and people are moving around the table in, in various ways and and it, and sort of showing that you can't move in certain ways just as a kind of you know I, I hate this quaternions thing it's really an interesting thing to explore and see this sort of you know how much we love it in literature and how much Dodgson hated it in uh, in in his uh, in his mathematics world but let me move on from imaginary numbers and uh, of course you can read you know more about all of this uh, if if you if you get the book uh, but my final topic really here is uh, information theory. And just very quickly, obviously none of us learned this at school because actually it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that we were in a position to really be able to learn um, and, and use in, in any sort of way. But information theory started uh, with the work of George Boole, um, who uh, wasn't very good at maths by his own admission, uh, but he had a kind of... Um, a really important insight he saw. He felt he'd seen this, uh, this this sort of way that we would get stuff from the unseen as he saw it. And, uh, and he sort of thought about training as an Anglican priest, uh, but he felt that there was something about human thought that he could reduce to numbers and he could work out how we think and how we get our information if he could only learn uh, the this, this sort of mathematical secrets behind it. So he taught himself algebra and calculus so that he could work with numbers. And in the end, he he, he worked with zeros and ones. Um, so the digital age was born with George Ball. Um, and, and he worked a way in which you could complex reasoning into a series of statements uh, and and then put them together and these statements would be true or false and you can put them together and just sort of basically he described the processes of logical thought uh, using mathematics uh, and using numbers and uh, it runs according to these uh, three things and or and not and we built these into um 
well, we built them into, so, so a man called John Venn actually built them into uh, what he called Eulerian circles, but we now know as Venn diagrams. So you can represent and and not and or uh, as these uh, you know, as these sort of circles, but you can also represent them as kind of you know switches. And if you sort of uh, go into the Intel chip and you go down down and zoom in zoom in on a you know, modern chip, you'll get to transistors, which are effectively switches, which are put together in a way uh, that gives you this ability to change electronic signals from one to another using George Boole's uh, ways of thinking. Um, and then that was taken on. Uh, Bull uh, was never really um, applied in, in his lifetime. Uh, he became a fellow of the Royal Society. People liked what he'd done. Uh, and uh, But he died without it really sort of making much difference to him. And then, um, interestingly, um, you'll... Uh, you'll like this, being skeptics, uh, he actually died from homeopathy. Uh, so his wife was a big advocate of homeopathy. And George Bull one day got caught in a thunderstorm, uh, came home, put himself to bed, uh, fell a bit ill. And his, his wife, Mary, um, thought that the best thing was like cures like. And so she poured loads of cold water over him in his bed, uh, soaked him and he got pneumonia and died, uh, which is awful, but uh, interesting. Uh, so it took you know, a long time, 73 years, in fact, before anybody really sort of moved Bull's work on. And that guy was a guy called Claude Shannon, uh, who really gave us the information age. So he learned how you, know, you can condense and compress information. He showed how you can transmit information and encrypt information. He really did the whole work by himself, uh, pretty much in one paper, uh, which was, again, his master's thesis, a bit like uh, David Packard. Uh, and this was the kind of information theory that was used uh, to uh, convey the images from the Apollo program. So that's how we saw you know, the, the moon landing, uh, the photos and the video and the sound. It was used on the Voyager probes eventually to, um, to be able to see the outer reaches of the solar system. It's, of course, used in mobile phones and the Internet. And you know, what we're doing right now is the legacy of Claude Shannon's work in, uh, in, uh, in information theory and how we handle it information, how we pass it forward, and how it can be compressed, as you see in that sentence, you know exactly what that sentence is saying. So that's my kind of overview of, of you know, the, the utility of mathematics, I guess. And, and then the next question we have to ask is, okay, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting, but does it matter? You know, uh, does it matter that no one's learned this? Does it matter that I'm finding it out as I research a book? And, and you know, of course, people know these little things, but if you put it all together, what, what do you get? And my um, my sort of next question, really, from all of that is, is you know, I, I want to ask you, you know, why we learn English literature at school, why we learn history, why we learn classics, and I think the answer to that is because we've learned that actually, if we learn to understand ourselves and we learn to understand um, what it is that humans do and who we are, uh, which is what these subjects teach us you know, where we came from, what humans are like, what they're capable of. Uh, when we get that from, you know, from literature and from history and from classics, um, and it kind of gives us an, a greater appreciation of ourselves, a greater respect for humanity, and maybe a caution about humanity's capabilities as well. Uh, it allows us to reach higher. It allows us to put measures in place that temper our darker kind of inclinations. Uh, you know, measures like democracy, uh, anti-slavery legislation, financial regulations, all come from really understanding what humans are like, uh, and you know, we implement them in the law uh, and. Our society has built structures, effectively, that are informed and improved by all these subjects, however indirectly. So my argument would be, I think we've missed a trick, really, by teaching only the technicalities of mathematics. So the, I think the human impact of mathematics and understanding it, you know, given that you know, this is what we uniquely do as a species of, of animal on Earth, it's as important as English literature to me. Uh, and, we, you know, we've always offered English literature alongside English language to students, but we don't offer any kind of cultural mathematics alongside the technicalities of mathematics. And I actually think that should change because I think our exclusive focus we have at the moment on the technical side has consequences. So, um, All this stuff, as I've kind of shown you, uh, we have um, this incredible sort of civilizational impact. But actually, um, let me give you this number. This is an interesting number, 36. So we turn a lot of people off mathematics uh, during secondary school. So this 36 is 36% 36 
of UK 15 to 24 year olds have a negative emotional reaction whenever they're faced with a number based task. So uh, this is known as maths anxiety. Uh, and basically that's more than a third of, of young people really are quite scared of maths. And you know, the, the numbers are really interesting to, in other countries as well. I've seen one study that says 93% of US adults will actually sort of recoil from maths before they sort of knuckle down to it. Uh, and the numbers are really interesting from this, this point of view. And um, so they literally hate maths. It's actually worse for girls. Uh, mass anxiety is bigger in girls than in, in boys. And that's kind of shown up in the fact that you know, UK A-levels, 38% uh, of those taking maths A-level are girls, um, and it should be 50% uh, for any other reason. And that's dropping as well. Our numeracy, uh, adult numeracy, is also dropping. So I feel like maybe we're not doing something right anyway. And uh, this is another interesting number here, 49 49% of UK adults can't do any maths beyond what they learned at primary school. And I'm not suggesting by any means that, you know, people shouldn't learn secondary math. They shouldn't learn algebra and some calculus and things like that. But I would suggest that maybe we're not doing the best job possible or using the, the time in the best way possible. So, you know, we've been turning people off mathematics, really, for generations now. And I think this side of it, this human side and understanding, you know, what what mathematics has allowed us to achieve as, you know, civilizationally or as a, in society, I think that that's, you know, important for us to appreciate. And I, I don't pretend to have all the answers. And if there's any maths teachers um, who are watching this and, and partaking in this, I'd be really interested in your perspective on this. Uh, but actually, I think, you know, this civilizational aspect, this human side of mathematics and how we've used it is incredibly important and incredibly uplifting for me. Certainly, I find it incredibly interesting and it sort of makes me feel like this is an incredible endeavor and makes me want to learn more about humans and more about mathematics. So, um, if you've learned nothing else tonight, uh, at least you know now that you're incredible because you can count beyond three, I think. Thanks very much for listening. And thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating. Thanks so much. That was a really interesting talk. Uh, the chat in the little Twitch side has been going crazy. Uh, everyone was really engaged with that. It was a really interesting talk. Um, for the rest of the audience, I'd like to remind you that we have questions still available to be asked on our Slido page, information in the uh, Twitch chat there. Uh, bring those questions in because otherwise I will be talking for 45 minutes about the history of accounting because that's something I'm actually genuinely interested to learn about. <laughs> Um, but we're going to be taking a 15 minute break now, which means we will be back at 8.10. So if you'd like to head off and refresh your glasses, uh, do what needs to be done. Uh, chat away amongst yourselves in the Twitch chat until we come back. But until then, once again, thank you very much to Michael Brooks for a fascinating talk. Big applause, emojis and so forth in the chat. Thanks very much indeed. And welcome back. Uh, I hope you all had a lovely break. Uh, I hope you all refreshed your glasses and you asked, I've seen you already asked some really interesting questions in the Slido. So we're going to get straight on with that. Uh, I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to um, use my power as the moderator to ask a question of my own before we get started. But I will do a little teaser trailer. The question you all want answered is, is there a pet and can we see it please, will be answered later towards the end of the chat, so you have to stay tuned to find out. Uh, my question actually was, uh, you touched on it in the, in the talk itself, um, but why does Pythagoras get such a big deal about finding out about his triangles when he was just copying everyone else? Well, it's a really good question. I think it's actually a really important question and sort of central to everything that I've started to think about maths. First of all, like Pythagoras, we're not even sure that was a real person, right? So, so, so we don't know that there was a guy called Pythagoras. We don't know. We do know there was a school, a Pythagorean school of mathematics, where a load of people got together and and you know, basically worshipped numbers and saw them as sacred and saw them as really important sort of ways to understanding the cosmos. Um, so, what's happened, I think, is that obviously you know the 
you know, the Babylonians, the Indians, the Chinese were all using the three, four, five triangles. They were all using right angle triangles for various things. The Egyptians were certainly doing it um, well before Pythagoras you know, even became a thing. Um, but the history of Western mathematics, which, you know, and especially European centric mathematics, which we all grew up with and is the this kind of the legacy that we have as you know, people mostly in the UK, certainly if you're in the UK, Europe and America, really your legacy was sort of written um, in in the sort of medieval times when uh, people started translating Euclid. Uh, and Euclid's elements was, you know, this this incredible whitewashing job, really, in some ways. I'm going to denigrate one of the most famous mathematical texts now. And you know, don't don't, don't hate me. But the point I'm trying to make is that when Euclid wrote uh, elements, he uh, erased all of the the contributions that came from particularly Arabic mathematics. Uh, and, and anything that came from elsewhere, really, and wrote it all as if it had all come from the ancient Greeks. And uh, what had happened was the ancient Greeks had had, you know, the great sort of, you know, um, insights and, and, and gathered lots of information. It was mostly preserved and passed on by Arabic mathematicians um, and Egyptian mathematicians in libraries. And, and then those texts sort of got passed through and Euclid sort of wrote from those and others that he found. But he kind of basically sort of didn't give any credit to the uh, Arabic mathematicians. It all was down to, oh, the Greeks are so great. And the Arabs and Persians, they kind of used it to do science. So, so he credited them and, and his contemporaries credited them with um, astronomy and they were good at, you know, the optics and they could do this kind of stuff. But mathematics was deemed, you know, to be so sort of fundamental that, you know, only the Greeks could have come up with that, which is why, you know, we have this legacy of like, oh, the Greeks were so amazing. And actually, you know, and they were also rational and they taught us how to think logically and all this kind of stuff. So we kind of, you know, revere the Greeks, but based on texts that really whitewashed other cultures out of it. So they, they were they were allowed to get away with, they, they were allowed to give the, the, as it were, the foreign people the credit for the applying of the stuff. But yes. The, yes. the pure it's, beauty of maths could only be done. Yeah. By because the enlightened because, Greeks. Because there was this feeling that like mathematics was so fundamental, you know, it was part of the universe. It wasn't, you know, it was like the structure of the universe. Everything is built on number. So, so apparently when they went into the Pythagorean school, they passed through an arch that said all is number, you know, and, and, and that was your kind of, you know, your way in. You had to kind of subscribe to that view. And, and I think we've got the legacy of that, even in our education system right now, you know, that, that, that somehow this is all linked to, um, you know, sort of some fundamental abstract platonic, as it's called, you know, kind of, you know, there's some abstract forms and solids and what we see is a shadow of uh, them. But, you know, there are these sort of, you know, perfect forms and numbers. Like the Greeks only really dealt with counting numbers, you know, one, two, three, four. They didn't really want anything else. Numbers scared them, and yeah, yeah, they didn't want um, irrational numbers, for instance. You know, that was that was a huge problem to them. But the square root of two was an irrational number, right? Because it didn't work. So, so, and yeah, so it's a, the Greeks are a problem. Okay, that you're talking about um, that, that actually leads on quite ne nicely to a question from skeptical Gumby from Oxford, who asks about the the teaching of maths and how we we. Something seems to have gone wrong there. Uh, secondary school maths teaching seems almost designed to put people off maths. <laughs> is, is there a better way we can do it? Um, and if so, why aren't you Minister for Education? <laughs> um, well, so first of all, I want to put a disclaimer in and, and say, look, you know, I'm not a maths educator, right? I'm, I'm a guy who's, who's basically started from the premise of maths is really interesting. Why don't I know more about it? But that, that was kind of the thing, you know, I actually started from the point of view of um, I was doing a talk uh, about three or four years ago, three years ago, and uh, people were talking about why physics is failing to find, you know, proper theories of everything and stuff. And I said, well, you know, it comes down to the fact that, you know, it's really bloody hard to do. And it's hard to do because the maths is hard to do. And we're all, you know, trying to put all of the universe into these, you know, into mathematical routines. And maybe we don't have the maths yet that's required for that. But isn't it pretty amazing that we can even start to try and do that, right? That we can encapsulate something about the physical world in a set of numbers and equations. So I'm coming at it from the point of view of like, okay, I wanted to explore this. And that's where this book has come from. So I, um, I'm not an expert in maths education. I mean, I've been reading quite a lot since, you know, writing the book about you know what i want to say about that what i what i think is going on and i think there are things going wrong right 
and I'm not sure how to fix them. But one of the things I think is, is I think it's really important that we don't put people off maths in the way that we are managing to do that. I mean, you literally, it's the last acceptable ignorance, really. Say, I don't do numbers. I don't, you know, I just don't do numbers. And you, you get people, like I, I saw uh, Philippa Perry on Bake Off, sort of giving away my secrets now. But she had to, she had to divide a rectangular cake into 12 pieces. And she said, oh, I should do this with a ruler, but that's maths, I just can't do it. And so she was just guessing stuff, you know. And you get, um, you, so you get, uh, what's it, Bill Bailey was on Twitter, said, oh, I don't help my children with maths homework. You know, I made it a, a principle never to get involved with algebra. And, yeah, so, so it's, it's sort of acceptable to say, I don't really do numbers. You'd never have someone being willing to say, I'm not going to, I made it a principle never to get involved with music, or I never no, made it a principle no. to get involved well, with well, art. Writing. So I saw an amazing uh, stat earlier today where uh, 50% of parents would say they would be proud if they were told their child was really good at reading and writing, right? And only 20% of parents would be proud if they were told their child was good at maths. This is in the UK. It's like we just don't we don't have a good relationship with maths and numbers at all, and I think that's probably the place to start. and And I would argue that um, maybe you know, that we need to train some school kids to be able to do you know GCSEs, A levels, university degrees, postgraduate degrees, become technical people. But that's a, quite a small minority, and I think there should just be an alternative pathway. Obviously, you need numeracy. You need to be able to do sort of, you know, probably not quite GCSE level stuff, but but for generals, you know, running your life, doing your accounts, um, you know, sort of paying rent, working out how much you're going to get, you know, from um, uh, you know from various sources, your know, income, whatever. You need to be able to do numeracy stuff, right? And you need that. But you don't need to solve a quadratic equation. I'd, I'd be amazed if there's anybody watching here who's actually solved the quadratic equation for some reason in their life apart from just pleasure. Um, you know, and I, and I think we have to maybe we have to acknowledge that and say, you know, here's a numer numeracy test at 13 or 14. You know, pass that, and then you can go on and you can do things like become a nurse. I mean, there's a problem at the moment where nurses, who, people who are applying to do nursing, are failing to get in because of their numeracy skills aren't good enough all right so we have a kind of you know a, a sort of bl block there a bottleneck and there's an organization called national numeracy which is working with the the um you know, the nursing unions to help to overcome that by saying okay you don't need to gcse you don't need to be fully up there but you need these skills and those skills and, and you know we're going to put those in place and then you can do your nursing course and I think we need to just have a kind of an ability to say, you don't have to be able to do everything. You need basic skills. And the ones who want to go on and do more, then they can do more, you know? Yeah, I mean, we all know that anecdotes are the best kind of data. So <laughs> in my experience, when I was training to be a teacher, when you, when you, when you applied to be a teacher, at least you did back when I was doing it, you had to do uh, a numeracy, a literacy, and an IT skills test. Yeah. To be able to go on and do it, and they were they were fairly basic level stuff, but it was it was always amongst the people I know that the literate the math the mathematical the numeracy numeracy side of things was the was the test that people had to do again and again and again until they got it right. Well, I and, don't know, I don't know when you trained, but now that's been dropped, so there's no uh, requirement for numeracy. Uh, so it's oh, teacher training okay. colleges are or courses are encouraged to do it and to help you know assess help the students assess their own numeracy, but it's not a legal requirement anymore to pass that numeracy test. Uh, this was back This was back early 2000s. Right, yeah. yeah. So, okay. um, it, was, it was just interesting. It was always the numeracy one that people yeah. uh, got stuck on. Um, we're going to ask a question from Igor, one I'm sure of many questions from Igor. Um, oh, wow, he's getting philosophical straight away. Um, is mathematics created or discovered? Do you think it is possible to achieve the same results with some other mathematics not made of numbers and equations? Right. I don't know what the second half of the question really means. Like achieve the same. I, I think there are lots of different approaches to doing certain things. So if you want to find out the relationships between, you know, a circle and a triangle, you can you can sort of put the circle and the triangle and deal with sines and cosines, or you can have it in a scheme of imaginary numbers. You can have you know, you can do different sort of ways of approaching those kinds of specific problems, I guess. Maybe that's what I mean. I actually think that mathematics is not discovered. I think I think we invent it. I think we create it. 
I think it's just relationships between numbers. So first of all, I would argue, you know, we created numbers. You know, we put names on quantities, right? And and so, you know, we got to four and five and six, and then we started finding relationships between them. And then we saw these shapes and we thought, you know, can we quantify something about these shapes? And that's, you know, that's how we found out about the properties of the circle and the triangle and the square and the dodecahedron. Unfortunately, the Greeks, you know, said, oh, the dodecahedron, you know, that's basically what God used to create the universe. And then people sort of got all like, you know, religious about it, about, you know, the shapes and the and everything else. And then they started saying, oh, it's all out there in the universe, you know, waiting for us to, to discover it. And so you get this idea that, that the universe is full of these mathematical forms uh, that, that mathematicians are out there sort of you know, discovering like bold adventurers. And mathematicians love this narrative, right, because it makes them, you know, look like Indiana Jones, basically. And, and so I think, you know, we've got a problem where we sort of think... And if you do that, and I'm going back to education here, if you do that, you create this idea that maths is some, you know, quasi-religious sort of sect. And if you're in, you're in. And if you're out, you're out. And, you know, the mathematicians and the or the you know, maths bloggers or whatever, they're kind of like the priests that give you access to some of this stuff. And mathematics has traditionally, all through history, been used as a power play. So the Egyptian priests use it as a power play. So they kept their their um, their gauges for the height of the Nile inside the temple, so that nobody else could see like what they see. So they could make predictions about the rising levels of the water, and they looked like you know basically they looked like gods. But they no, nobody realized that they were just reading the numbers, you know, on, on the inside. And I think that's the danger we have is that yeah, you know, if we sort of see it as this discovered thing that exists out there in the cosmos then we're basically excluding people who don't really get it and quite deliberately making ourselves look good. And I, and I think that's a dangerous thing. So I think I think it's an important question, actually. You know, for me, I, you know, I've come across it for years and I've always sort of laughed about it, but now I'm starting to think it's, it maybe we need to take it quite seriously. Yeah, it, it's gen that's generally not, a, not an aspect of maths that I thought about. Na maths for me is a thing that I use on a daily basis to do my work. And yeah. it's, I use it almost like, to a certain extent, almost black box like. I get a thing, I need to know how many photons come out the other end. Yeah. I do some maths in the middle, yeah. and the number of photons comes out. It, it, this talk in general has just been a, it's, it's, it's deeper than that. There's a, there's, a, there's a whole philosophy, there's structures and societies involved in this that's made it the way yeah. it is. Yeah. Um, We'll move on to the next question, I think, uh, and that's oh, from Paul, which actually is related back, I think, to the first question from Skeptical Gumby. Uh, secondary school maths seems to be geared ultimately towards calculus as the, the end point, yeah. when you, calculus is the final boss. Um, would it not make more sense, more generally useful for us to, calc to culminate in statistics? And I'm going to add a little bit to that. And is the idea of anything cul maths culminating in anything a useful okay. idea? So, I mean, to the, to the point about statistics, oh, my God, yes. If, if we could, as human beings, get our head around what these groups of numbers mean and what they're actually telling us, as opposed to what we think they're telling us or, or, or what other people think they're telling us, and then they, they lie to us with, the, with their statistics... I think that statistics is so underrated. I mean, so I've, I've got a, a chapter of the book is on statistics and you sort of realize how important it is in terms of just living day to day life. So living through a pan pandemic, you know, we've all been faced with these statistics, right? And we, we're faced with exponentials and um, and you see the curve and you think, oh, that doesn't look too bad. And, it, and, and, and you've got people telling you off the telly, it's an exponential, it's an exponential. And they're like, no, it doesn't look that bad, really. I'm going to go it's, out. It's not an exponential until it does that bit. Yeah, exactly. Here, it's not and, exponential. And once it takes off, oh, my God, it's, it's, it's gone. And But people can't uh, can't actually grasp this because, I mean, as I said at the start, you know, we don't naturally deal with numbers. Numbers don't come naturally to us. And exponentials, that's, you know, especially true. And uh, there's a thing called exponential growth bias, which is like humans are just unable to really project an exponential and see where it's going to go. So there's been studies done that that say um, that show that, for instance, you know this is a problem with people who are in debt and their their loan repayments and they grow exponentially. 
And and uh, the studies have shown that people just aren't very good at predicting how bad things are going to get for them down the line. And the worst thing about it is the more confident they actually feel about the numbers, the worse they are. So so we have this sort of misplaced confidence in our ability to deal with numbers, exponential numbers, and and that's really important to know because you know if you're if you're giving financial advice or you're or you're giving medical advice in a pandemic, you need to understand that people just cannot conceptualize what is going to happen and and the numbers are sort of staggering when you do i've sort of got this example in the book i can't remember the figures exactly but you're filling a bacteria um a, a bottle with bacteria at an exponential rate you know and it takes an hour before you know it's, it's like you know after three quarters of an hour there's hardly any bacteria in the bottle but they're doubling every minute and then all of a sudden like you know at one minute to midnight it's only half full and you think oh that's all right and then suddenly it's full and then three minutes later three bottles are full of bacteria you know, it's just like it's just crazy and um so understanding that and statistics of of healthcare and understanding you know how we test drugs and whether they work or not vaccines you know do vaccines work i mean it's so important for people to be able to say oh okay so they did statistical they're not just like oh yes it works or it doesn't but there's confidence and it's reducing things by 60 percent or whatever and you, you need to be able to sort of conceptualize and deal with these numbers in the modern world i think so i think statistics it's sort of dull. Part of the problem is it's, it's, it's actually hard to bring it alive, really. Um, another problem with statistics is that it's sort of, it's one of those things where lots of statistical measures are effectively judgment calls. So you kind of have all this thing and then you say, does that matter? Is that important? What's the cutoff for this sort of being significant? And actually that comes down to judgment calls a lot of the time. It will always be, an, not an arbitrary, but it will be a balance of factors. We, yeah, there yeah. will always be a certain number of, for any any policy, there'll be a certain yeah. number of deaths that will result as yeah. that policy. And there'll be a certain percentage of but, GDP. Yeah, I mean, I certainly think that that's sort of more useful on a day-to-day -day basis than calculus, right? I mean, I think yeah, yeah, if, you, yeah. if you ended school maths with, you know, here's how to live in the world and here's how to spot trends and here's how to sort of understand, you know, what does it mean that, that this review, this, this product has got a four and a half star review, but only five reviewers, but that other one's three star review and there's four thousand viewers. You know, you, and you can do that with statistics. You can work that out. You know, what, what should you believe about something? So I think that's really important. As to the culmination of mathematics, I mean, I, I don't think there is such a thing as, you know, okay, now you've learned all you need to know and you you know you won't by 16 have learned all the maths that you need to know probably but you know schools should equip you for for sort of living and then going on if you want to do technical subjects where you need maths then that that should be right and my view is that i think it would be great if if students left school with an appreciation of what mathematics actually is and and how important it's been in society just as they leave school with some sense of what a democracy is and and how important that is, you know. It's I think it's a it's a similar thing, and then maybe we wouldn't be in the position where people just avoid maths for the rest of their lives. Yeah. And we don't expect when we're when we're teaching English literature, we don't expect them to know all the plays, or we don't expect them to know all the poems. We need them to know what forms poems can take, what forms plays can take, yeah. what plays can do for you. And if we can have that that sort of yeah, and I, I think people. Maths, I mean, 15 year olds who are learning English literature for GCSE, I, mean, I don't know how many of them really sort of understand the point of it, but they know they've got to do it to pass their GCSE, right? And um, and the same, you know, I sort of I don't really understand the obsession with classics, you know, and people are learning classics. And I, I heard Mary, what's her name, Mary Beard on a podcast recently. She was saying, oh, why should we learn classics? Well, obviously, because if you know classics, then any visit to an art gallery or museum is much enhanced. I thought that's a terrible reason to be you know, spending that much time on the curriculum. You know, maybe uh, museums and art galleries should do better. So I don't know why we learn English literature, really, apart from to understand something about human beings, I think, and what they're capable of and, and the way things they are able to convey, which, you know, is quite interesting. And I think maths is exactly the same. I think if you learn maths from the perspective of being a humanities subject, I think you would open it up to a lot more people who might say, oh, you know, I never really realised that it had this influence or that. You know, I never really realised that, you know, it was mathematicians that built, you know, all these incredible buildings. You know, and then they might sort of get more interested in maths. And I think the more important thing is not that they're able to do maths, but when people give them thing arguments based on maths they don't just dismiss them they actually you know i think it's a really important tool to be able to just accept maths is a powerful thing in the world if that makes sense 
I'm going to ask another question of my own on this one. Do you think that there's going to be, in the future, you said you're not an educator or a writer on education, but do you think there's a chance that we can use what we're going through at the moment to help us, if nothing else, to ground mathematics in something tangible and real for students? We, we can use what we're living through right now as examples of mathematics and... Yeah. I'm, I'm actually sure that, no, I don't know if there's any math and, uh, math teachers out there. I'm sure math teachers are doing this already. Yeah. Yeah, they will have taken the opportunity to say, oh, you know, here's an interesting thing. It's not exactly on the curriculum, but it sort of feeds into things. And, and you know, for their students who are interested, you know, something like, you know, understanding the numbers behind the pandemic is, is actually a really interesting application of maths. And, uh, you know, I have no doubt, you know, the teachers that I know are good at, you know, grabbing every opportunity they can. So I'm, I'm sure it's happening already. Uh, Andrew from Peterborough wants to know, do you have a favourite number and why? Um, I kind of, I like the number 13. Um, and uh, the reason I like it really is because my first book was 13 Things That Don't Make Sense. And I just realised, um, and that came from a, a new scientist feature that I'd written. And I literally wrote the, the headline, you know, the title, because I thought it sounded intriguing. Um, and and somehow this this has a this is a powerful number for some reason it, it intrigues us and you know it, it's interesting the kind of relationships that we have with numbers you know so so we are irrational about you know about numbers and we have you know in high, in California they used to have a highway six 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 and they had to get rid of it because people wouldn't travel on it yeah. And um, they, they, they renamed it because, you know, the people said there's so many accidents on this on this road. And of course, there weren't any more accidents than on any other road. But but, you know, people were sort of obsessed by it. And so um, I kind of do sometimes, you know, if there's a honestly, I mean, this is going to sound ridiculous. But if there's a number, you know, if, there's, like, if I'm at the gym and there's a weight that I use that is 13 or, you know, 1.3 or something like that, then I will I will probably um, use that. And, and I will remember that more than I'll remember any other number for some reason. I don't know. And, and so I think we develop a relationship with numbers. Uh, sorry, and, that's, and I'm not saying it's rational. We, we don't always have to be rational. That's, that's the beauty of this. We don't have to always be rational. Uh, I'm sorry, my computer has just made a, a mistake and I've actually lost the list of questions. So I'm going to ask someone to oh. put the, list of quest the link back into the chat so I can re-click on it. And then I'll be able to go back to the question. Uh, I'll tell you an interesting number related. Yeah. To um, so, so there was a physicist called Arthur Eddington who was convinced that you could find you know, numbers, uh, you, you could find the universe through numbers. And he was obsessed with the number 137. And 1 over 137 is a thing called the Fine Structure Constant. Yeah. So it's like a, a really um, sort of central part of physics to understand the interactions between light and matter. So and he, if ever he would like, had to leave his coat in a locker room or something like that, he would always ask for it to be put on number one three seven. I, I like the fact that we, we these supposedly uber rational mathematician minded people have these superstitions almost. Yeah, I mean Eddington was particularly bad at this. I mean, he just he's, he was a bit of a mystic, really. Um, I've got the questions back up now. Um, the qu question from Chromium fifty two is. Why three as the limit that seems to be where we can naturally count to? Why not five because we've got five fingers? Yeah. Um, is there any connection for animals and their ability, their digits and their ability to count? Okay, so I don't really know the answer to this question. I, I know that it is. it does seem to be three is the kind of limit. And I don't know if anybody had the experience of counting those bits of fruit. And, and I certainly, when I do it, I can see three. And I see four by counting two twos. You know, it's like it's like a different thing. Um, it's probably something to do with the brain. So, so the brain wiring isn't naturally set up for numbers, right? Um, as I said, you know, we, we don't really see these things properly. And the interesting thing is that when we learn to count as children, we learn to count on our fingers. And this is sort of cross-cultural, you know, there's, there's kind of all kinds of different ways of, of, of counting fingers. And sometimes that gives you a base 20 to work with, you use your fingers and toes. And, uh, you know, some cultures, they'll use knuckles rather than, you know, they'll use joints and, and everything. But, but you know, we use that. Uh, uh, and we do that, it seems, because our brain is able to co-opt the, the motor and the mapping of fingers to store numbers. 
So, so we're in a position where um, we basically learn to count using our fingers and our brain learns that numbers are associated with this part of the brain that is actually you know, now fingers to the point where if you put people in an fMRI scanner and ask them to do basic arithmetic, the areas associated with finger mapping and finger movement light up, even if they're not moving their fingers. So, so you, you literally do finger counting in your brain. And if you're really good at arithmetic and it's not a problem, then you literally get less lighting up. It's just less effort. And, and people who struggle with stuff, you know, it sort of glows. These finger parts of the brain glow. So it's like we've just co-opted that system to use as, um, as, as a means of manipulating these abstract things we call numbers. And we turn them into our fingers. And, and like, at the time we're counting, I guess we're not really using our fingers. So we'll just use them as numbers. And it's a really kind of interesting thing. It's just, you know, so so clearly we're not natural counters. There's no part of our brain that's evolved to do counting at all. But our brains somehow co-opt bits of their wiring to do the what counting it? because it's so useful. That's cool. I, I can't do maths without waving my hands around. <laughs> I, I just can't. I, yeah. I, if, if I'm doing anything, I'm, I'm moving things around or whatever with my maths. Yeah. I'm, so I, I totally, that makes sense. But it's really interesting that it's properly deep in the brain sugar yeah. being I, I, I was actually bits. going to show the um show the pictures but i just didn't have time in the in the presentation so that's cool um based on similar we got another question from anonymous which is linked to the question number of y3 um and it's do the baraha people have more than three children if so it seems odd that you can't count past three how do you have a strategy for cooking serving food Keeping an eye on, I'm going to extend the question to I mean, more than three children if you can't <laughs> count to three. They they can't they don't bother counting beyond three. So so if they've got more than three children, it's it, it's just more children. And and actually most of the time when you look at their language, and I've not looked in, in huge detail at this, and, and Caleb Everett's book number is really good on this. Um what they'll do is they'll count one and then it's like they've got a sort of word for one and really a word for everything else. But if pushed, they'll do two and three sort of thing. And you don't, you think you need to be able to count to more than that if you've got four children. But you actually don't you just see your children, are they all there or not? You don't count them. Yeah, and, and, and if you're preparing food, you will probably just prepare an amount of food. They're not working from recipes. So they just sort of say, yeah. this much will do. And another thing that's worth pointing out, I think, is they're apparently an incredibly happy and... Um, uh, what's the word, you know, content people. It's not like they're lacking anything. They don't feel they're lacking anything. And they just don't see the need to to sort of bother with these complexities of language that, that give them this. And and it and it turns into, uh, they also don't really bother with the future and the past. And, and they sort of live very much in the present as we're all encouraged to do at the moment. And so they don't really have words. And this is an argument about, you know, there is a, a sort of philosophical argument about whether you conceptualize things that you can't, you don't have words for, and actually, you know, so so they they don't have certain words associated with time and future and stuff like that, and with big numbers, and and you know, and, and it doesn't hold them back in terms of you know contentedness. And they, they, they won't hold them back in terms of doing you know what we do, which is build stuff and and you know and create complex technologies and stuff like that. You can't do that without numbers. But they, they weren't sat there waiting. Oh, I wish I knew how many children I had. I, no. I hope someone. I hope someone comes from Europe in a big ship. Yeah, and it's a really interesting conceptual shift because you know we would think you know you need to know how many children you've got, but actually, why do you? You know, why do? You? Yeah, you 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 can look, and I don't need to be able to count how many people are there to roughly know all my mates are in the same room, yeah. Yeah. and I'm missing. You know that guy's not there. Or, yeah, I mean, if you've given them names, you can literally go through the names. You don't have yeah. to associate it with a quantity. Um, question from the bear. Uh, you mentioned a lot of mathematical game changes. Do you have any thoughts, predictions about what the next one could be? <laughs> and could we talk about this in private so that you and I can just spend the money and invest in that <laughs> and not tell the rest of these folk? So, um, oh, mathematical game changes. Um, I mean, it, I, honest, I mean, honestly, the answer is really no. I mean, I, how would I know? I mean, an interesting thing I've, I've just been writing about for new scientists is a thing called fractional calculus, where um, I don't want to get into complexities, but but you do this kind of 
if you've got a car moving along a road, the distance it's traveled against the time gives you the speed, right? And that's sort of first order. And then uh, the speed at the time over which the speed changes gives you the acceleration, right? And that's second order. And apparently you can have stuff in between first and second order. So you can have like 1.5 order differentiation in calculus, right? And uh, and integration as well. And I, I really wasn't aware of this until it was brought to my attention. And that is enabling people to do all kinds of new um, control for technologies and stuff, feedback loops, controls, which, you know, before they've just been going, eh, 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 and now it's like quite control on this fractional calculus. And um, and when uh, Gottlieb Leibniz, I think it was, worked out calculus, so in about 1630 or something, somebody said to him, oh, you know, is it possible you could have something in between the first and the second order? And he said, I don't know, but if, it, if you could, it might be useful. And it, it took basically until about 1830 before anybody sort of worked out how you might do it. And then uh, somebody worked it out in like the 1970s. And and these things take hundreds of years like to, to evolve. Yeah, and they, no idea like what's, you know, what's sort of currently baking in the background as the, the next game changer. You know, I mean, nobody knew that, that uh, John Napier was working on logarithms for 20 years until he came up with his, um, his uh, you know, his, his sort of big innovation. And... It's interesting because, you know, maths, I mean, that's the other problem with the Greeks, right? They would say maths just exists there and we discover it. But actually, I think it clearly evolves. And, and you know, this bit of maths has evolved into that and then that's evolved into that. And, you know, when um, Andrew Weil solved Fermat's last theorem, he used maths that didn't exist in Fermat's time. So if Fermat did have a solution to this thing that he said he'd had, then it wasn't anything that we've been able to find and I think it probably didn't work because there was no. just no maths that exists. You know? he, he, he had an idea, but it wasn't, he didn't yeah. have a rigorous test. I, I, don't, I don't think he had a rigorous test for it, so I, I think he couldn't have solved it, given how hard it's been for other people to solve it since. And so, I mean, the short answer is I don't know what's coming up next as a game changer. <laughs> I'm going to extend on that myself a little bit. We're, we, we're, as physicists, we're running into a problem at the moment where we're, we're, we're kind of stuck. We're struggling with quantum mechanics being interacting with um, Einstein's gravitational theories, and we're, we're, there's problems with standard models and so forth. It took we we had to get imaginary numbers before we got quantum theory working properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it possible that we don't have the numbers yet? Absolutely, it is. So that's why we're not going. Yeah, I mean, we haven't sorted them out. So there's a guy called Avi Loeb at Harvard University who, who said that he thinks the whole dark matter issue, you know, about this missing matter in the universe and the dark energy, he said that's probably down to the fact that we don't have the maths to deal with it. You know, Einstein needed new maths in order to be able to do relativity, right? And um, and and he didn't really fully understand the maths. In fact, he used to get um, a woman called Emmy Noether to explain yeah. stuff to him because he didn't really understand it and she was a brilliant mathematician. Um, and, and so I think it's entirely possible that there is some other math that needs to be done before we can solve certain problems. I mean, and imaginary numbers is a good example. You know, you can't literally, quantum mechanics doesn't work without imaginary numbers. Yeah, it's just not a thing you can do. I, um, next question is from Akif Shannon um, with his information theory. Um, should we switch to base 12 numbering system and leave the old outdated 10 based system behind? <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> I mean, 12 is, is difficult. 10 is really nice to work with. Yeah, you know, we have 10 fingers. Yeah, it's very easy to divide and multiply by 10. 10 works really well. And we still have these hangovers of the Babylonian system, you know, the 36 and 360 degrees in a circle. Um, you know, and we sort of deal with that, but it's not ideal. But then having said that, after the French Revolution, um, they tried to decimalize everything, you know, in math, uh, in life, you know, in the calendar, the hours of the day. And it, I mean, it just didn't really work at all. So you know, let's stick, stick with what we've got. But please, let's not go back to pounds and... and uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, last but one question from Dr. XD Spicy. I hope I read that right. Uh, are you annoyed about, about the way the Americans have bullied the rest of the world into accepting their version of a billion? <laughs> back to the long billion. No, life's too short to get annoyed about things like that. I mean, I'm, I'm annoyed that the Americans use the imperial me uh, system over the metric system. I just don't understand that at all. And uh, and I'm I'm worried that we're you know we're sort of getting these government mandates that we're going to go back to that because they want U.S. trade deals. But I genuinely don't care how you define a billion. I think I think ten to the nine is fine, isn't it? I I don't 
really have an opinion on the <laughs> number of billion, millions in a billion. It's never yeah. been something that I've had to worry about in my yeah. bank account or any other part of my life. If you're going to expend energy on that, I think you need to get out more. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the absolute last question, which was the one that everyone's been waiting in to hear, is right. do you have a pet? And can we see the pets, please? Yes, I have a pet. I have a dog. Uh, she is a rescue terrier. And I can show you a picture of her, but I can't bring her in because she'll bite me. Uh, so she, <laughs> which seems like a good, uh, I don't know if you can even see that. Probably not. Um, I can. You can. Uh, so that's, that's Rafi. She's a very nervous and thus aggressive uh, terrier who, who doesn't like people in her personal space, doesn't like other dogs in her personal space, which makes going for a walk really a joy. <laughs> and um, uh, but she's about ten years old, and we got her as a rescue, and she's lovely, and we love her to bits. But yeah, I'm, I'm, if I if I literally picked her up and showed to show her to you, she would bite me to get away. Sorry. Uh, slightly disappointing end to a fantastic <laughs> talk, though. So once again, I'd like to ask everyone in the chat to go crazy with the emotes and the emojis and all the other technical stuff that I don't even come close to understanding. Uh, and thank you very much, Michael Brooks, for a fascinating talk and a really interesting conversation. Uh, thank you. Don't, cheers. Don't cheers. forget the rest of you. And we have the pub opening um, in a few moments' time, which the um, moderators will put links to in the chat next to us. Uh, feel free to come along. You can sit. You can sit quietly if you want to. You can join the chat if you'd like to. Uh, we're a friendly bunch. Come and join us. We have a talk next week, the details of which will be announced a little bit later on. Uh, there's a few things going up in the air at the moment, but there will be a talk next week. Um, so until then, thank you very much. We've had a lovely evening and goodbye, everyone. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks' time. Goodbye. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye.